The orders must have just went wild. I knew that one was coming. I don't know, maybe. I'm, I'm not a big WoW fan. Small World is a solid game. All right, well, we're here to answer your game, game your game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Best way is for questions to come through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for another live AMA where we answer questions from our chat room, the lobby, as well as a couple of questions people have sent in ahead of time. Thank you to our patrons and those people on Twitter and everywhere else who do get in touch with us who can't be here for the show. All right, there was something where to go. There was a question way earlier that I was like, we got to save this. Where did it go? So we do one of these live Q&As once a month to give our fans who join us live here on Twitch a chance to ask questions directly. Be sure to join us the last Wednesday of every month and be ready with your gaming and game night questions, or really, since it really isn't Ask Us Anything, it doesn't have to be gaming related. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, not, uh, not seeing any questions just I yet. I three questions in the chat already. Where are we seeing? I'm not. I'm not. Um, That's not so good. Well, will not any nice. of you be participating in the virtual gaming con this week? You know what? I looked into it. Uh, virtual game con costs 10 bucks to take part in, which just seems really odd when Gen Con online doesn't cost anything to take part in. Mangani Con virtual didn't cost anything to take part in. Uh, plus, they're not. It, it's up to the people who are participating to set up their own events, including their own um, software. Like, So I could go on there and I use tabletop events and go, I am going to run Raiders of the North Sea Friday at 8 p.m. And then I have to decide what platform I have to then own. Like I, Tabletopia is the one they're pushing, but then I have to tell people to go on BGA. Like they're literally letting the guests determine what events are happening mixed in with official Dice Tower and Board Game Geek events. So at first I actually thought no one was, I'm like, this is a little nuts. Like you're, like you're putting all the work on the fans, which seemed a little weird. But then I went there today and today on Wednesday were 150 events. And I would say 75% of them were full. Mm. So people are definitely taking part. The weird part is it's not centralized. So like people are running games on Tabletopia, Tabletop Simulator, Board Game Arena, Boite de Like people are playing games everywhere. Just on Skype, just on Discord, using, um, what is that stupid software everyone's using for webcam stuff right now? I can't Zoom. remember the name of. Zoom. Zoom, yes. There's all kinds of Zoom games. Now what there is, is a central Discord server and what they've done is set aside rooms. And this feels very con-like. So if I had signed up and tried to run a game, I would have been assigned a time and a date and a room. And I would be in like BG06. And then the players would have to be in BG06. And then I would have to tell them all, you know, boot BGA, invite me as a friend. Okay, now we'll play type of thing. Which is just, it's it's oddly loose, I, I guess, is a way to, to way to describe it. Now, on Board Game Geek's homepage, they do have, like, a they call it the head stage where they're doing videos. But it wasn't what you'd expect from a head stage. Like, when I went there, it was someone playing, I forget what board game now, but some, someone just playing something solo on Board Game Arena. And I'm like, well, that's your head stage? Like, that's your premiere, hey, look what's going on? Is someone playing a board game on solo? I, I don't know. I it's I, I find it very, very surprising they're charging in the first place. Now, you can get in free if you set up an event. So what I was going to do, is I was going to run Terraforming Mars Saturday night at 8 p.m., which would have been 7 p.m. their time, for four players. Then I found out Skype's not, or Steam's not supported. So they, they're not doing Steam events because, well, then people have to own Terraforming Mars on Steam, I guess. They have to pay to and own Terraforming Mars on Steam. I don't know. The other thing that's really weird is I can get a ton of content for free, and I'm not sure if I should because, like, anyone can join the Discord channel. And you can go into all the exhibit halls and you can watch all the videos. I didn't pay 10 bucks. The only thing you can't do is actually sign up for a scheduled event. But then there's waiting rooms. So I could probably just join a waiting room going, I'm looking for a game. Now, I didn't do this. Like, that seems somewhat questionable. So I don't know. Uh, virtual game clients, their first time doing it. It's obviously working. Like I said, 15 rooms at like full and you got to think at 10 bucks a head and four people per game they're making some money off this well probably not though because anyone who's set up a game is in for free so most of the people yeah, there have people probably set up a game games, in order to yeah. to be there 
Um, I, mean, I don't know, you know how many people are actually setting up games, though. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of them if there's that many games going on. Yeah. So. I don't know. I like. I really don't know if uh, at how well it'll go. So the other thing was, if I had taken part in it, there wasn't enough notice for this con. Like there was literally less than two weeks notice, and we have a podcast, right? So everyone who's here live would have known about it. I would have been like, hey, come play with the bellhop on Friday night or Saturday night. But that's it, because our podcast doesn't come out by t- till Tuesday, and on Tuesday the con's done. Right. Like there just wasn't enough time to promote the fact we'd be there. So I don't know. I I I I might jump in something by the end of the weekend. I probably won't. Um, I don't know. I we'll see. <laughs> so interesting in the in the chat room, Evil John asks, "How would you improve this? There really aren't online tools for managing virtual queuing or crowd management." Well, I mean, there's there's two solutions I would go with personally. Uh, the first one would be to go the way Renegade Con is. Open it up. Yep. Don't charge. You're you're wasting your time in some ways uh, because there aren't centralized tools to manage this. Um, the other option, uh, which is a, a higher end option, but if you were going to charge, you'd have the ability, would be to use WebEx. Um, for those people who, not in, uh, who aren't aware, WebEx is a corporate um, Zoom solution sort of but it's got it's way more granule and there's way more control uh so i could have four people playing a game each with their own webcams and then an entire other audience that was would let in if they had the password um and control it that way um so there are options in order to do that um again this week all week long i'm taking a workshop uh from my company uh from a a a uh, company I'm a dealer for, uh, or my 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 employer is a dealer for, and I have to sign up for events. Um, they actually built a web app, and, or you know, you know, a cell phone app, mm-hmm. and I sign up for events. And if I sign up for an event and I'm approved, they send me a link that goes into my Outlook calendar, and it has a password that allows me to get in as a mm-hmm. participant. Um, and then the hosts have their own passwords to get in as hosts, or in this case, it would be you know, as, as players. So I think that's somewhat what they're doing with tabletop events. So what Renegade did for queuing was you could buy event tickets. It was from Eventbrite, I think was the site I had to go to, but to buy tickets. Now tickets were free, like you didn't have to pay for them, but I had to go through the process. Right. What those would do is guarantee you a spot at the table at a certain time. And they were also selling all the pants and stuff that I attended, but I didn't buy any. And the only reason they were actually doing that was to track numbers. And there was no way for them to require people to have them. And this is the same problem that this con's having is all the panels are like on places like Twitch, right? Or YouTube or Facebook Live. And there's nothing, there's no way to limit. Like I I think you can do member only chat or subscriber only chat type stuff. I don't think there's a way to stream on Twitch without it being public. No, no, you can lock down chat, but right. If you're you streaming, you're chat, streaming to everybody. Like, you're streaming, you're streaming, right? So you can't lock that down, right? So there's there's no way to prevent people from doing that. But what they did do that worked was every game. Now the thing is, Renegade Con small. You didn't have 150 games. You they you they only had six games. They were doing demos of. They had the game, and then they had the waiting room. And what you had to do was go into the waiting room, and there was a command. I don't remember what, but it was like bang play. You would put that in, and they had a bot in the thing that would put you in a queue. And then it would tell you approximately, like, you are number three in the queue, your game will be starting next, or you are number six in the queue, you will be the third game from now, or whatever. And that seemed to work really good. Now, I didn't actually do it, but, like, like Renegade had everything very centralized with the, the Discord, plus they very specifically said, you are using Tabletopia, or you're using Roll20. And they have partnerships with these people, so these companies are willing to work with these online game conventions. Now, one thing I did see for Virtual Gaming Con that's kind of cool is Tabletopia again worked with them. You get free access to every game on Tabletopia with your badge. So for $10, you can play all those premium games on Tabletopia until Sunday at midnight, Right. which is kind of neat. But that's also their way of making it so that, like, I don't know, it just the whole con feels like, hey, we're here. Here's a hall. Do your thing. Yeah. And that kind of is what it is. But then I looked at how many scheduled events there were, and I'm like, I guess it's working. Yeah. 
No, and I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think the real problem I have is with it is the cost because yeah, like it just, you, if you're paying for something, you need to get something different. And I'm not really clear that's what's happening in this case. Um, whereas, you know, if you were to go to the, um, and, and it's, there's, there's definitely some upfront, uh, cost and issues, you know, you're setting, setting up a web, uh, a WebEx X system and, and, you know, you can have 160 viewers for, you know, without any problem. Um, but you need to, you need to set that up and, and be prepared well in advance for that kind of, uh, infrastructure. Well, the other thing too, right? This is Board Game Geek in the Dice Tower. Like that is a huge fan base. Absolutely. Like, that, is, that is a massive, massive fan base right well, there. And I'm sure a lot of them want out, to support right? Right there, there's a, there's a yeah. level of it's ten dollars and yes I could get around it but I want to support the Dice Tower and Board Game yeah. Geek so I will give them the ten dollars even though I could walk in the side door and not pay. Yeah, basically. So what the ten dollars does do, and and this I think is value added just because I looked at those hundred and fifty events. I didn't look at every event, but it was very clear it said buy next to the ones that had slots, and it was very clear that like seventy five percent were full. And you needed a ticket to be able to go into tabletop events and reserve. And as far as I can tell, there isn't what Renegade had. There's no virtual waiting room. There's no just get in line. If you want to play a game, you need. if you want to set up a game, you're supposed to register it. And for one, you get a free badge, which is cool. And two, if you want to play a game, you have to sign up. So it's unlike Renegade where you could just like basically stumble into a demo room. That's not happening here. Now, what I didn't see, what I did see too, is the number of sponsors was huge. Like there was a ridiculous number of companies that have rooms in their Discord. Right. Now, I clicked through those, and I realized it's only the first day, and I only went there earlier today at, like, 11 in the afternoon. So it's, like, really early the first day of a con, and I didn't see anything value-added in any of those rooms. But then again, I felt guilty even looking at them because, again, I didn't buy a badge. Right. But then, I don't know, is it like walking into Origins and, and you're hanging out in the hallway and you just never go in the dealer room? Because you can do that without a badge at Origins. So I didn't feel guilty for doing that, but I don't know. Maybe, like maybe by the end of the weekend, it, it, it'll depend on my mood. Maybe Saturday I'll be bored and I'm like, you know what? Why not? I'm, I'm going to try out some games or I'll find something. The other problem was tabletop events is not a happy way to find events and search. Um, like when you go to Origins, you get this ridiculously like three inch thick book with all the events that are going on and it's crazy. And it's, it feels like that. Like, yeah, it's only 15 pages, not a thousand but I'm like, I don't even know how to find a game I'd want to play. Like, right. And that's and that's problematic. I mean, discovery is a, a huge issue in any con, whether it's a, whether yeah. it's Origins in person or online. Um, you you know, we've talked about this uh, in other episodes. Even you know, you, you why do you go to a con if your friends are the only ones playing? Um, yes. Now, if your friends are internet friends you know if i haven't seen danielle in two years because of a pandemic mm. i might want to get to a table get at a table with her because i never actually play with her even though i consider her my friend but you know if it's mo and d and sean hamilton who i don't see all the time but i can play a game with them more often than not when we're not yeah. locked down maybe i want to go somewhere else and play something with someone else that you know or or a game that you might not enjoy but catches my interest you know you like cthulhu but i want to go shoot i don't know something so play a military game where I, i'm sneaking right. around to, to sh you know kill russians i don't know something different that you might not be interested in that's some of the best part of uh, a con and if your discovery issue if you have discovery issues you're more likely going to fall back on that oh well what games are you in oh maybe i'll try that then rather than getting out there and finding that new game that you could love, but you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think you're going to discover anything new at this kind of con. Now, again, Renegade was a little more specific because they had demos of their newest games, and they were promoting demos of their newest games. I don't think this, but but again, to be honest, Dice Tower Con and Board Game Geek Con are not cons to discover new games. Like the physical versions of those two cons are very much go and play games. Not, not big dealers. There's no demos. Games don't get released at them. They're not John Con. They're not Origins. They are game with your friends, game with new friends, game with people you only see once a year type of con. And I think they've actually kind of nailed it that way because that is definitely what this feels like. Right. So I don't know. Maybe I'll have more to say after the weekend's done. Um, 
But like I said, I do plan on checking out Gen Con online. It seems to be a bit more organized. Again, this just feels like here's a space. Do what you want with it. And I'm kind of confused by what it's being used for. Right. I know. I, I, I think it's awesome that the, the dealers have their own rooms. Because one of the things I can really see that useful for is if you're in a game and you get that question. Hey, I'm playing Small World 2. And what the heck does this mean? You can hop over to the Discord channel and ask yeah. Days of Wonder what the heck you're supposed to do here. Like, and that's now, true. In theory, that's the perfect place. You know, you've got yep. this this real available resource for games, and you know, Days of Wonder, or whoever should be right there to jump in to help people and yep. increase that engagement Very and true. that enjoyability of their games. That would be a perfect use for those dealer spaces. Uh, as well as See, just, that's the other you know, thing selling too. stuff. <laughs> so here's another another difference between this and, and say Renegade Con. Is I don't know who's running any of these games. It could be anyone. And that is slightly worrying. Like if I show up to learn a new game, how do I know they're going to teach it right? Whereas when I went to a Renegade demo room, it was a Renegade staff member or volunteer who was taught the game by Renegade, who's excited about the game, who is hyped about Renegade, trying to teach Renegade's game, basically sell it. But that's what I expect from a demo. Right. Whereas if I show up to play Joe's Terraforming Mars game, and like, I, who's Joe, right? Now there is a code of conduct that you have to agree to, so thumbs up on that. So I, I don't think... I, I, I am hoping they're making it a safe space. That's something that I'm sure will come out online in the next five days if it's not. Um, they do have a very solid harassment policy and all of that. I, you have to read through all of that before creating an event. So I said I tried. I tried to. I thought I was going to do Terraforming Mars on Steam. I just, I, I don't know. I also thought of doing Clans of Caledonia on Board Game Arena, but then I thought about the fact of what if five people show up who have never played before? <laughs> I was like, oh man, how do I say experienced? So I don't know. It might happen by the end of the weekend. But I am a little concerned that like you don't, but it's the same thing at Origins, right? Like, or or Gen Con or any other con, you don't know the people you're gaming with until you game with them. Well, yes and no. I mean, at least with you, if you've got, you know, uh, a con book, um, there's usually information about, you know, a lot of those people, not necessarily every single uh, DM, but uh, a lot of the DMs will be in, you know, in case guests and things. And there's usually bios uh, available for their um, I don't know if they've got any bio space available in the DM section of each. The thing is, like, it's like Origins. Anyone can sign up to run anything. So only the guests are going to have bios. Right. So I just dropped a link into the chat. This is the schedule of events. It's currently filtered to Wednesday board games and card games. I'm assuming it's doing that. And at this point, let's see if it's even gotten bigger. Yeah, there's 16 pages now of just board games and card games. So yeah. you are looking at, like, they're numbered, right? The highest number I see right now is 796. And I'm sure it's higher than that. But, right. like, here, Hive on Board Game Arena. I got to say, that's probably someone just trying to get a free ticket. Like, if you're going to play a quick game of Hive on Board Game Arena, like, come on, it's a two-player game that takes under five minutes. Yep. They set it for they set it for a one-hour time limit. So the info here is there is no board. The pieces are added to the playing area, thus creating the board. As more and more pieces are added, the game becomes a fight to see who can be the first to capture the queen bee. Not the best description of I've ever read. Host, I'm not going to mention just in case it is someone new. <laughs> uh, event number, uh, what type? Three, Two people. So they're not going to play. They're just going to watch, I guess. Uh, adult 18 plus. So they only want Americans. Or Americans, sorry. That's the next <laughs> line. They only want adults. It's it's in America's Chicago time zone. It's at Wednesday tonight at 11 p.m. Um, it's going to last one hour. <laughs> it is start. a board game. It is in room BG18, and there is going to be a voice channel and a text channel in Discord, and you can click. The links are right here, which is nice. It'll drop you right into the right room. Uh, which system will be used? Board Game Arena. There's a link to Board Game Arena and a link right to the game on Board Game Arena. And who's attending it is Nick and Zero waiting for tickets. So I could sign up to play Hive tonight, or I could give the ticket to a friend. But I must have a badge to purchase tickets, so I can't sign up for this game ahead of time which is kind of cool now if i switch over to like there's miniatures there's party social games there's seminars there's even video games if i switch over to rpgs this is this frightening part there are four scheduled today that's it wow so this is very much board game geek and the dice tower there are right. only four rpgs you have changeling the lost summer of the meteor journey in the old kingdom maximum apocalypse so one of the problems is nowhere does it list what system these are 
Right. So that's rough. It's and I also see two of the games were canceled. Yeah, well, I mean, the first, you know, I looked up here, and my first problem is um, you can't actually um, look at more than however many games this ten. is in, 10 games ten. at a time, which ten. is horrible. I um, I don't want to look through however many pages this are. Yeah. Should, let me let me expand a list to 500, and I'll just scroll or sort um, by by whatever. But, I mean, you know, game 313, double feature, which turns out to have been canceled, is a Google meeting playing uh, you know where you basically guess a movie name based off of a car a, ga- a card game that has 12 cards okay it's it's a sure. you know print and play pocket game um you know yeah, it's... well again i think some of these people have created events yeah just to get in right yep like for example i want to play iron edda with tracy because tracy is fantastic there's no iron edda games dang how about hydro hackers no like, I, I, I don't know. How about if I just try typing fate? So this is part of the problem. None of them can say the game. Right. So I type fate and I get Maximum Apocalypse RPG, get in the van, the hunt. So at least someone put the name of the game. So if I go under RPGs, like people aren't putting the name of the system in the title. So I don't even know, right? Like the, like RPG should be broken into D&D or fantasy. Yeah, what's it's interesting, like if, is, if, I, there... if I search, if I put all event types... And then just yep. type RPG in capital letters into the search. I get three events, two of which are canceled. Yeah. All days. Yeah. So, well, games, that's, that's supposedly... just this. That's today, I guess, but uh, okay. Wednesday, but if I do all days, what do I get here? I get two pages. So, uh, you know, 18, um, but what games are they? Right? Like they're all just yeah. titles. Yeah. Like having to find it. Like and then war games. Like war gaming is a big deal. I don't know how well war game works online. All weekend there are less than ten war games going on. Like it's just right. I don't know. But then you go to board games and there's pages and pages and pages. Which is understandable given the you know the, the, who it is, right? Who it is. Yeah. Let's see. If I want to play Terraforming Mars this weekend. Oh, let's see, this is cool. This is why it's you can play Terraforming Mars with Conicor. Right. That that's cool. As the owner of indie boards and responsible for publishing Terraforming Mars, so they are getting the big big names. Right. Which I'm, I am tempted. Two hours. How are you going to play Terraforming Mars for only two hours? <laughs> and where are you going to play it? Is Ooh. it on um, Terraforming on? Mars Deathmatch? What are they using? Discord voice and video. Meet in the Stronghold Games voice booth, and we can speak on audio and or see each other on video. Again, ensure you have Terraforming Mars Digital installed on your device so you know my Asmodee Digital ID. So here he is running it on Steam when I found he couldn't run on Steam. Right. So Steam or Tabletop. Wednesday at 11 a.m. But I, how are you going to finish a game of Terraforming Mars in four hours? Well, they have two a three-hour three 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 hour duration Terraforming Mars deathmatch on the main stage on Sunday morning, See, which is... Sounds- uh, bueno core versus board game geek versus dice tower and they're doing a head-to-head head-to-head see that's uh, cool you know big you know family match sort of thing so yeah i could have i could have signed up to play it on steam because it must have terraforming mars installed on steam ios or android what's right. weird is it said there was still room available this says five people are waiting for tickets so that's if people back out like mm-hmm. i can admit i like tabletop events it's what um word uh the one that was in toronto had i'm trying to blank on the name of it. breakout con breakout use con. this piece of software I had issues. I had issues. With <laughs> I had issues we we, with we are spending know. too much time talking about virtual gaming con. That, the problem with this is this is ever green. No one's going to care about this next week. <laughs> well, you know what? Though no, it's I, I would say it is evergreen because con management, whether it's digital yes. or in yeah. person, is an important thing. Uh, no, and no, we've no been this to part cons. of the conversation where we're talking about what games are being well, played yes. on what days and how many <laughs> yeah. events. Terraforming, no, Terraforming our, our, our Mars. Talk about what, what's our solution and what you can do and using Discord to queue up, that's all great. But talking about what specific events are happening at a con that's already going to be dead by the time people listen to this probably isn't yeah, very no, useful. No, probably not. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, yeah. And Deanna, Deanna mentioned she fears yeah. the quality based on folks wanting free tickets. And that's, that was kind of my point. I'm, I, I, like, I don't know. I... I try to think the best of people i'm kind of it's difficult nowadays <laughs> so no, I, I worry there there's, there would be some uh not great games being run yeah and that's and that's going to be something you run into every time you start giving away free entry for doing anything 
you know, if you, yeah. you know, hey, come and volunteer, you know, maybe, whatever. Maybe that was their solution to get people to make events. And they're worried they wouldn't have enough events. So by charging and giving it a free, this way they end up with thousands of events. I don't know. I, Possibly. I don't know. All right. Well, uh, moving on. I got one question from one of our Patreons earlier on. If you guys want to jump in with other cha- uh, questions in the chat room, we'll get to those. But uh, we're going back to a uh, patron question. Uh, patron of the show, Google, asks, are you currently or thinking of designing any games or RPGs or any future plans to develop games or RPGs? All right, so I don't know how many people know it. I have written a few RPGs. They are out there in the wild. Um, what I probably should do is uh, get them on like drive through RPG or Itch.io or something like that. Right now, they are just on RPG Geek. They are available 100% free. Uh, you can find them on my publisher page. So I think on Board Geek, I'm under Maurice Tuzano instead of Mo Tuzano. Uh, unfortunately, this drives me nuts. Okay, your side complaint about Board Game Geek. I so want to change my username to Tabletop Bellhop, and they won't let me. I am stuck with my old username of Gilvin Blight, or I can make a new account under tabletop bellhop but then i lose all my logged plays and all my board game collection and everything so chad are you listening chad can you help us <laughs> no they, they won't no? they, they have okay. once made one exception they have made one exception uh so that's my board game geek username but i do have like an rpg designer page i am i can literally legally say i am a published award-winning rpg game designer um one of my games i'm i'm I, what's we're proud of not that i hate the other ones <laughs> one i think is neat because no one else has done it before this goes back to the steve jackson games because i'd never heard of the fantasy trip and i named my game a fantasy trip and it is a game you play when on a road trip and the main mechanic is i spy well and it's a fantasy rpg like dwarves elves fighting orcs and the the, the actual conflict mechanism uses i spy and it's meant to be played on a road trip when and specifically when driving to a con because this was written at con season and people have played it and i've gotten positive reviews uh the one i'm most excited about though is actually uh about playing small heroes and the the existing title is the diminutive rpg uh was inspired because arietti the movie had just came out which gave me huge flashbacks to watching the borrowers and Playing an RPG that played in that setting. So your Tom Thumb, your Thumbelina, as well as your Rats of Nim, like anything small. And the point was small heroes, big problems. And that one I'm actually really proud of. I've gotten some really good feedback from members of the Gauntlet community before the Gauntlet community exists. Um, Lowell Francis, who's now known as Lowell Francis of the Gauntlet, um, said it was one of the, the best games that tied mechanics to the theme. Because it was all about smaller dice are better, and you're always trying to reduce your dice pool, and the entire game is basically what's better. So I have uh, what I should do is fix that. So I did do a rewrite of it because it was written in 24 hours. I did do a rewrite and publish that on Board Game Geek that made it a little better. But like I should sit down and write it. I should convert it to a Notepad file and send it to an editor because well I wrote it in Word and. Man, if you move a single letter, you lose all the formatting, and it's oh, terrible. <laughs> because I did this thing where I used the like illuminated manuscript thing, where the the first letter of every paragraph was bigger, and it looked good. But man, it, if you try to change that letter, you would spend half an hour just trying to fix your Word document because you shouldn't write RPGs in Word. No, we can write them in Word, but don't yeah, format them. Not not Word. a lay. It's not layout software. <laughs> no. Oh, not no, at all. Not. My God, I, I fought with that so much. Like, like I probably wrote the game in half an hour and then spent 23 and a half hours trying to lay it out. Um, so, yeah, I have written games in the past. As for doing it again in the future, probably, I don't know, not, no big rush to. Um, I think I'd rather go sit down and refine those games and make them better. Now, there's other ones. There's, um, there is, uh, I, I wrote one that I, I joined the Iron Chef. Game Chef, sorry, not Iron Chef. Game Chef Competition. And got so insulted by the reviewers of my game that I'll never take part in that again. Um, I was told my designs were words I can't say on the air. Um, so that I won't take part on. But that is published. It's um, I think I called it Polarity is the name of the game. And yes, the basic mechanic didn't actually work. But you had to design it in a ridiculously short amount of time. And it sounded like it worked. But it had to do with adding dice to top or bottom of something. So to a negative or a, or a positive space. But I didn't think about well enough to realize the math was the same 
So like adding a minus on the bottom was the same as adding a plus on the top. So so I get it. The game didn't work, but I, the way I was told my game didn't work was insulting enough. So I plan on never ever even booting that PDF again. I don't even want to look at that game. I find that one traumatic. Um, I wrote a game called Ego, where you are playing the magic item of the character to your right, and then you have ego. So like you are a magic sword or a magic axe, and it's actually the will to try to take over the player. And if you win, you take over the player's ego. You become the dominant ego. That one won an award. Uh, mechanics were so-so, but the concept I thought was really cool. Now, that's all on the RPG side. I, I Again, I, I doubt I'm going to come up with anything new. What I should do, I just don't have the time. Like, I don't even have the 24 hours. Like, it's just it's surprising. Like, you wouldn't think, a yeah, board game reviewer who writes about games and talks about games all day is busy. Trust me, I am. Now, most of it's trying to make money on affiliate sales, but still... It it's, keeps the kids fed and lets me do this full time. It, what I should do is start trying to take part in stuff like the 24-hour RPG contests and stuff like that and get back into designing that way. Now, on the board game side of things, up until recently, I had zero interest. Once I had a concept, someone's done it now, so I no longer need it. Uh, when Dominion was first popular and Trains came out, was uh, deck building was huge. Everyone loved deck building, and I wanted to do a deck deconstruction game. Because one of the most fun parts of playing a deck builder to me was thinning your deck, getting it down to that, like, every round I pick up the same five cards and do a ridiculous amount of damage, the next round I pick them up again and hit you with them again. That was my mo the most fun I ever had playing a deck builder, specifically Star Realms. If you can get a Star Realms deck down to five cards that all just do damage, it's fantastic. So I wanted to make a deck deconstruction game where you started off with, say, a 120-card deck, and your opponent had a 120-card deck, and it was filled with garbage. And the goal was to streamline your deck as much as possible. And the first person to, uh, whatever, get their deck down to 30 cards or whatever. I, I, I didn't, I just had that concept that I wanted a deck deconstruction game. And that exists now. I am totally blanking on the game. It has to do with mining asteroids. I haven't played it. I don't know how well it worked. I can't remember the name of it. It might come to me. So once that came out, I was like, all right, someone did it. I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to do it. Someone else did it for me. But I don't know how many weeks ago it was now, but since being quarantined, uh, Deanna and I tend to probably every other Friday or so, we like to have a night away from the kids. The like, kids are still here, but they they leave us alone. They let us sleep in in the morning. They get to watch Netflix all day. And we have a late night, and we usually enjoy a few craft beers because we found uh, Heads Up Ontario people. There's a place called Brewer Eats that will deliver you local craft beer. So we get craft beer from Brewer Eats or other local places. And we play some, uh, we usually start with a heavy game. We usually play something heavy and then slowly reduce it to sillier games going on later on through the night. And one of the games we've been playing during this, early in the night actually, is Unlabeled, the blind beer tasting game. Now, this is a game I kickstarted. I don't remember what year now, 20, a long time ago, actually. As 17 far as or 18. Is concerned. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a while ago as far as Kickstarter is concerned. Yeah. One, one of the earlier games I kickstarted. And I got this game, and it's okay. Like, it, it, it's neat. It gives you something to do while you're drinking beer, which is fun. I already rate beers. I Every beer I have, I open up an app, and I go on the app, and I talk about the different, you know, the, the taste and the, how carbonated it is and the aftertaste, and I give it a review. So I'm already doing this, right? So now I have a board game where I could add to that guessing what beer it is. And it's fun enough. It's all right. It's kind of fun. Like I said, it's one of those, if you're drinking beer anyway, why not do it? And it's a lot of fun with two people, but the rules as written just weren't that good. They, they were basically a push your luck game where if you didn't know your beer, like great, you just get no points almost all the time or you wouldn't push your luck. So we made up house rules for it. We've now made up so many house rules for it that I don't even know if you consider it the same game. Like the, the basic premise is still the same. And the other problem is, I don't know, like, I guess we found out they're from Michigan, but obviously the people who drink beer in that part of Michigan don't have the same taste as the people in Windsor, Ontario, at least, or my friend from Edmonton who rates beer, because, like, they don't even have IBUs, and I don't know anyone who's considered a beer snob that doesn't care about IBUs. Like, you should be betting on IBUs. Plus, there are a ton of beer styles that just aren't accounted for on the board. And it's odd to me, like there's no chocolate stout on the board at all, or chocolate porter, or and and like what, there's not even like a specialty stout that would account for it. Well, I've strongly been considering remaking this game 
and possibly reaching out to that app that I talked to that I use to rate my beer and seeing if they'll license it. Like I strongly considering it because I think I can do a better job. So I, I guess that's possibly slightly insulting to the makers of Unlabeled. But you know what? I've talked about your game so much that people are starting to buy it because they see it on Twitter. And then I tell them what game it is and I see people buying it through my affiliate links. And uh, like I know I've sold some copies of Unlabeled, which it's good. It's not terrible. It just it could be better. And I feel like I could we could do it. We could somehow market it. But I know nothing about publishing games. Like, I, I don't know. I, I think I'd have to pitch it to someone and I don't know what board game publisher would publish a game about beer now steven bonacor of stronghold games is a huge beer fan so maybe but i don't think it really fits his indie boards and cards company like i think he might dig the game but I, plus i have zero published credits <laughs> now i am not a designer nor do i play one on tv uh nor do i pretend to be one here on the show uh but i have to say you talking about your concept for a the rpg where you are the magic item with ego taking yeah. over top of i want a board game because i think a board yeah. game is better than rpg where you are playing a magical item in a magic store and your goal is to be the item that is purchased by the adventurer coming in i think <laughs> you think it's already out there no it's uh, something similar but, there but, is oh what is it called Oh, it's based on reality TV show. The the oh, I'm drawing a blank. This is terrible. My brain is not in the right place for so, an AMA tonight. The deconstruction card game that we were talking about. While Mo thinks about uh, that, it was a Xenon Profiteer. Uh, okay, yep, yep. Was was uh, for for a significant period of time one of the only uh, card yes. deconstruction games out there. There are apparently uh, others since, but. Uh, uh, See, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, Fine Sand, I believe, is is a newer oh, that's deck deconstruction. Priest. So that that's the um the designer yeah. of Power Grid. Yeah. So that right, is another deck quest. deconstruction. Bargain, Bargain quest, quest is okay. the game I'm thinking of. But you don't play the item. But what it is is you are the medieval shopkeeper. You're the you're the D, you're the you're the the magic item shop in D and D. Right. And you are trying to lure the adventurers to your shop instead of your opponent's shops. Okay. So it's not you're trying to be the one item that gets bought, but you're the shop you want people to shop at. So I think it, yeah. it could be a reason. Sim yeah, yeah. Quest. But I can, but I can definitely th see you know like you, you know you've got the the magic sword, singing sword versus the the yep. the bloodthirsty axe. Uh, you know, competing oh, we for totally do it as a, a but wait, there's more. Oh, there. Oh, hey. It, it could Yay. be a pitch game. We could. It yes. It could be a pitch game. <laughs> you get a whole deck of different magic items. And you have a deck of personality types and yeah, a yeah, deck yeah. of quirks or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. We've got some real possibility here. That, that's got uh, some real possibility. We, we may have a print and play <laughs> deck builder. <laughs> um, so there we go. Yes, apparently we do think of designing any games, yes. RPGs, but Mo is already a published yes. and award winning RPG yes. designer. I, I realize it sounds like I'm bragging, but you know what? Someone a long time ago had this thread about, um, what's that term? Oh my God, my brain tonight. Imposter syndrome. And was going through about self-validation and was like, are you a real publisher? Are you a real designer? Are you this? And they had a list that basically went, has this happened? 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 And you actually got badges for it, which were pretty cool. And at the time, this was Google+. Plus. I used to have those badges at the top of my profile because I was an award-winning published game designer, were the three awards that I qualified for because I won the RPG Geek 24 RPG contest back-to-back -back two years in a row, right. um, which was not with Diminutive RPG. It was with Ego and uh, Fantasy Trip, which I need to rename. It's going to be like Fantasy Road Trip or something because I now know there is a RPG called Fantasy Trip, which actually just been reprinted, so it's even worse now. <laughs> and one of the people who wrote into the show thinks it's a better tactical game than D&D, &D, so fair enough. All right. Um... Not a lot of questions in the... Uh... So we do have this one that is from someone in the chat. Uh, oh, there we go. So, uh, yes, no, absolutely. Uh, so in the chat, but also in uh, one of our patrons, patrons show Math Guy Days asked us earlier on, if you magically had a group that was guaranteed to meet weekly and play a game of your choice for the next year, year. what board game or RPG 
would you play? And we we're assuming the pandemic is over at this point. So yeah, we, can, so. we can ignore the, uh, the social distancing concerns we have at this particular moment. All right. One year. Exactly. I think we should give an answer for both. I think you should answer this too. Why not? Um, for RPGs for one year, I really want to say DCC, but because it's limited to one year, I am going to go with shadow of the demon Lord because shadow of the demon Lord, you literally only play. Oh, you know what though? If you're playing every week, I think you might get through it too quick. <laughs> I think it was, so Shadow of the Demon Lord, uh, you play through levels 1 to 10 and tell a complete story and then it's done. I don't know if that would last a year if you were meeting every week, though. Because I don't know if you level up every session. So, like, I don't know if it would take 52 sessions to get to level 10. Right. So no, I'm going to switch back. I'm going to go back to DCC then. At first I was thinking Shadow of the Demon Lord, but you know what? You, you might do that whole arc too quickly. If you actually met every week for a year, if you had 52 gaming sessions in, I don't think you want to do 50 or five Shadows of the Demon Lord campaigns. Yeah, and John so is I'm, saying I'm you, definitely, you definitely you uh, definitely exceed. If you level up <laughs> yeah, every yeah. time. Yeah, see, I, I thought so. I read it. It's been a long time since I've read Shadows of the Demon Lord. I've got a review posted on the blog. It's actually um, Robert Schwab actually really liked it and has a link to it on his web page, which is awesome. But I haven't played it yet. So 10 um, sessions is what you get. Yeah, you get 10 sets. Yeah, see, 10 sessions is not going to last. I don't want to play it five times. Yep. So I'm going to switch back over to Dungeon Crawl Classics. Um, I have been really, again, though, I think about it. You know it's an AMA when I'm, like, changing my mind <laughs> mid-sentence. Are your characters aren't going to live long enough in DCC to play through 52 sessions. Like, you're going you're gonna to get, I don't know how many sessions, maybe not even 10. And then, unless you just keep making new characters, which is part of it. No, I'm going to stick with it. I really want to run DCC. I want to play DCC. Um, I like D&D, but I don't like all of D&D's mechanics. I, there, there's a lot I like about D&D, and the main thing that draws me to Dungeons & Dragons is the tropes, the, the aesthetic, the, the, the things that everyone knows. When you sit down at a table, you're playing D&D, what to expect as far as the different races, the different settings the the magic level the the fact you're going to be heroes the alignments the gods there's a certain feel to D, D games dcc gives me all of that with a system that to me sounds more interesting so that's why i want to run it you get that familiarity of playing your traditional fantasy rpg with the really cool mechanics of the dice and the sliding dice pool and luck and the crazy tables for the spells and corrupting magic, which I think is just a carryover for me from Warhammer that I really like magic that corrupts. That's just something that I like in my games. So yeah, I think Dungeon Crawl Classics is is my final answer. Um, the, the other the other option would be Star Wars from Fantasy Flight Games. One of them it would probably be um, the 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 original one, the Shadow Wow Edge of the Empire. The original one where you're playing like basically scoundrels right although i do own all three books so even for a year i could probably mesh in all the other character classes yeah for me it's tough i mean uh i think in a perfect world um i'd probably play at a table of yours every week for a year <laughs> year but that's not really an option uh for me it would almost certainly have to be digital no matter what it was uh just no, i think you know, just throw that away if you could play but, anything but I, if we're really, throwing away the pandemic we may as well throw we away go. the Fair whole enough. distance problem uh i have to say i am really i got you know i got involved in a mask game at the end of last yep. year uh and unfortunately it kind of fell apart uh but i would love to get into a solid group and just dig into masks and uh you know sort of delve deeper into the bbta mechanics um and uh i you know i really enjoy superhero play and and that one has really caught my interest um the only part i don't love about masks is it's very uh teen oriented like the the concept oh, yeah. of masks is you are teenage mm -hmm. superheroes um but i'm okay with that I, I would prefer not but i can deal i'm a big boy uh so is mass suited to long-term play? Cause I know a lot of PBTA games are best suited to short story arcs because they don't have enough character progression or changing. Um, nah, again, I haven't, I haven't played enough of it, enough of it for yeah, long okay. enough to really know. Um, the, the whole fail forward thing could conceivably be a problem. 
But if you know you're playing for a whole year, you dial back yeah. the you dial back that progression. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't um, you know mechanically just hit the brakes on that and 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 it would it would and because it's a superhero game episodic works right so you can do yeah. a series of short arcs mm -hmm. um and as long as you're you're controlling the speed of that upgrade so that you are so that you aren't gonna you know peak out until that last month of the year uh and and that's when you throw thanos in or what you know you know the big yeah. bad that that needs fully maxed out uh characters oh fully fair so sticking with RPGs, just looking through the chat, keep them involved here. I see uh, Deanna would like to play 5th edition d and I think she'd rather play, if you're going to play every week for your 2nd edition advanced Dungeons & Dragons with skills and powers and combat and tactics, I think is probably a better answer for her. If you had like the, the imaginary group that would show up and play whatever you wanted. Uh, but yeah, D&D. &D, um, Evil John noted they ran Horde of the Dragon Queen for over 40 plus sessions. Wow. Uh, Ryan, that's one I considered. Red Maple Ryan saying Star Trek Adventures with a year-long story arc. I would love to run a Star Trek game again. The only Star Trek game I have is FASA, and we only played it once. Like, Sean came down from Toronto at the time to play in that Star Trek game, and it was awesome just because, just like I like D&D, &D, everyone knew the tropes. Like, everyone just was able to play Star Trek. Everyone knows what Star Trek is. Everyone knows the techno babble and stuff like that, and everyone just, like, piled in on that. And it was so much fun. So, yeah, it would be totally up for doing Star Trek. But I'd have to find a system. Well, I guess I could run it in that old system. What I would like you to try, this is always how every show we start talking about this stuff. I'd come up with some game Sean has to play when he comes to Windsor. You have to try the Marvel Heroic Role Playing from Margaret Wea's production sometime. Yes. That is such a fantastic system. I love it. I hate the fact that it, they lost the license because, man, that was good. Now, they are the company that put out Sentinel Comics. Right. So that would be the compromise, would be to play Sentinel Comics, except I don't own it. Right. So there's that problem. All right, moving on to board games. Uh, the problem, like, I'm spoiled here because we have this, uh, except for the quarantine, that'd be Gloomhaven. Right? Like, what game? If I had to play one game, right? Like, one game for the rest of the year every week would be getting back to playing Gloomhaven with Tori and Kat. Like, I, I would, that's what we should be doing now. <laughs> and I would love to actually finish Gloomhaven and then maybe try Draws of the Lion. Uh, instead of playing it as a separate game, though, I am looking forward to Jaws of the Lion looks a lot more approachable. So I think it's going to be good for um, like bringing uh, that's something I think I could bring to the local game store once the pandemic's over and play with people there as opposed to needing the same group. But we'll see when it comes out. But I would love to finish our Gloomhaven game like uh, that is literally should be happening now. We are playing Gloomhaven tonight at 830 Eastern, except there's a pandemic. And unfortunately, Cat is a frontline worker in the medical field. So, uh, like, I don't know when we'll be able to have her over. Like, she's about as high risk as you get. So it, it may be some time, like, before we're able to get that going again. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, honestly, for board games, um, I wouldn't even know where to start. I mean, I don't play long-term board games. Uh, it's not something yeah. I've ever really delved into. Um uh i i do play uh i have uh 14 <laughs> games going right now that i play every day and most of them we play over and over and over again um so yeah it's it's i've got bga for that so that that that's my yeah. uh i already do that <laughs> i gotta admit it would have to be a campaign game like i wouldn't want to play terraforming mars 52 weeks in a row or go cuckoo or azul or any standard board game it would have to be something with some kind of campaign element or legacy legacy element like if, if i had to pick something like right now that wasn't gloomy with tori and cat i don't know if it's long enough but i think clank legacy I'm, i've been hearing fantastic things about that game i just don't know if there's 52 sessions in that box whereas gloomhaven there is so i don't know if it's big enough um at all so uh, Red Meeple Ryan does have a question that ties into this. I want to know if we're going to have weekly plays of Giant Jaws of the Lion starting in August. And to be honest, we might. Because, we again, we probably won't be getting back to our main Gloomhaven campaign. Uh, maybe Deanna and I will two-player Jaws of the Lion, and that'll replace our Gloomhaven streams. Because we do have fans out there who are missing our Gloomhaven streams, which just kind of feels awesome. 
But I also miss it. Although it's going to cut into Friday night date night. We're going to have to move date night to Saturdays. <laughs> I, I, I need my meat and cheese and beer and unlabeled and complaining about unlabeled because beers aren't on it. So uh, Ryan's also bringing up uh, role player, uh, role player adventures, R O L L yes. player adventures, uh, which is live right now on Kickstarter, which is a one to four player cooperative storytelling board game. I am curious about that one. I love role player. Role player is a fantastic dice drafting game. Um, Thunderworks game. That is a game that if origins was happening, I would have hoped to have brought home. <laughs> Fortunately, it's not. It does look good. I'm probably not going to bat the Kickstarter at this point. I'll probably wait until it hits retail. Yeah. Unfortunately, but, um, even though it does have a solar option, that's a little on the pricey side for me. Uh, it starts yeah, at a hundred bucks. Uh, yeah, the basic, cheap. basic, uh, uh intro there is a hundred bucks so that's that's scary the goal the goal of it is so when role player came out it was designed with the theory that enough people out there think that the most fun part of D i d i'm going to use D as a generic because it's fantasy races the most fun is making characters so they made a board game about making and optimizing D D characters basically and it even has like strength dex con and whatever and you roll 3d6 like it's it's very much based on D D characters but then a bunch of people played and went well now i have this character i want to do something with it so they put out an expansion where you then do the next step and you fight a few monsters and i gotta admit i haven't tried that i i haven't tried the expansion well then they went to the next step and when now you're going to make your character a role player and you're going to be able to bring it into role player adventures and play an adventure. Now, I don't know how much of an RPG board game it is. I'll admit I haven't dug into it that much. I did see it went live. I clicked through it. I looked through it, went, ooh, that's quite the price point. Then went, oh, wish I was at Origins because Tim Verling, or Verling, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing your last name wrong, Tim, is uh, one of the representatives from Thunderworks game that I get along with really well. And I think I would have been able to convince him to let me bring a copy home if they had any. Uh, if not, I would have got at least a role player expansion <laughs> to bring home and try. Yeah, so I mean, it you're getting cool. you're getting a lot. You're getting twelve adventure books, six double sided adventure maps, uh, oh. journals, character sheets, tokens, markers, pads of uh, stuff, cards, um, dice bags. It's I mean, yeah. you're getting a lot. So I mean, it's not that it's not worth a hundred dollars. That's just a lot of money for me to drop on a board game right now. That's that's all. It's uh you you are you are definitely getting your money's worth there. Uh I think without a question. So uh and I did like our uh role player. Uh, Deanna taught me role player at uh yeah. Bri- at Brick or not Breakout Con at uh Q- QCC. QCC. Yeah, it's um, solid. It's, yeah, no, it's a very it's solid a game. game. Um, all right are we gonna end this or are we gonna do one last question uh well that one last question is one heck of a question so that might and that, that might actually be almost an episode on its own if we jump if we really jump into that that particular yeah, question it depends how much we go too deep into it that's the problem yeah i don't know how all right so i i think we'll give the we'll give the chat room one more chance i gotta remember to save this question then to throw into next week's so it's, it's just a, we get we got feedback on one of yeah. our one of our things that asked for some recommendations and i was saving that just in case we didn't get any questions but i it's awesome that we did get questions from the chat room tonight so i cannot complain at all no no absolutely not um no thank you everyone for the questions you do have a chance to give us anything else uh yeah, we spent too much long too much time talking about B not BGG Con virtual gaming convention. Wasn't that isn't that what it's called? Yeah. And yes, yeah. virtual gaming BGC. Con. BGC. BGC. But realistically, and again, I mean, other than then when we drifted off into that uh Terraforming yeah. Mars discussion at the end, uh I think there's some 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 good insights into managing cons. Yep. No, I get it. That is why we, we took it. And plus, we were, yep. we had a little bit of a late start tonight. But we have still quite a bit to get through. So. Yep. No, that's fine. Ryan is saying, don't <laughs> blame. You can blame me. I always seem to manage to ask a question that generates a big ramble. That's what we want, actually. This is a goal that we've set. I don't know if people have noticed it. But my goal for the AMA is now is to get like two to three, uh, three to four, somewhere like three really solid questions that we can really dive into. Because yeah. one of the problems in the past is we talked about so many things. That I'm like, hey, tune into our show where we talk about Minotaur Milk and Gold Coins and how how our favorite games, our least favorite games, Kickstarter expectations, the first games we backed, our favorite coffees. Like it was just too much, yeah. right? It was 
I'd rather get some nice deep yep. questions we can actually sit and talk about. A so. deep a deep dive on four three or four topics is is yes. really kind of ideal. We do want all the questions, and if we do a que- if we have a, an episode where we do forty questions, it's not the end of the world. But no. it is nice to to dig in and get into some meat of stuff, and I think that uh, that con one was a good example of that. Yes, we we had a, we did. If you go back yeah. to our first AMA, I, I believe it was, it was our first AMA. Someone on Twitter asked uh, asked about Minotaur milk, and uh, we had a discussion about it. See, forty questions. If we did forty, I totally do it. But it would be an entire episode on forty questions. We wouldn't have a review. We wouldn't have anything else. We'll just answer forty questions quickly. They can be like yes, no, favorite <laughs> game, and you just say one thing. I totally do that. All right. Well, that's it for this month's. AMA. Remember, we do one of these every month on the last Wednesday of the month. Be sure to join us next week when we'll be back to answering questions from our mailbag.